you and I have both talked about this idea of like childhood complexity, childhood challenge, really helping kids rise to the occasion and letting them showcase their abilities in meaningful ways. We see a lot of parallels here. Both of us just happened to watch this video from Charles Cornell, uh, which is amazing, uh, about the number 12 from Sesame Street, which you should definitely check this out. But during this video, Charles Cornell goes through the song, the number 12 from Sesame Street and talks about just how insanely complicated that song is. <laughs> That is such a sick line. And the idea that like they didn't dumb down the content in order to approach kids. They recognize the fact that kids also like complex, meaningful things just like adults do. Really what we want to dive into today is talk about learning and progressive education, again, through the lens of video game design. See here a previous video about behaviorism and game design and talk about like why complexity matters in learning experiences, like why we should make things fun, but also challenging. We'll start, we're gonna play the Pajama Sam game. What's this called? No no need to hide when it's dark outside, which Ooh. Uh, is like the famous one. Um, this is okay. like the most famous Pajama Sam game. If folks aren't familiar, if you grew up in the, the 90s. Um, You're a 90s, only 90s kids will remember yeah. Pajama Sam. Um, or like, like 80s. I think some 80s kids played as well. I was gonna say, um, I don't think I have any recollection of uh, Pajama Sam, honestly. I, I don't think really? I ever played Pajama Sam. Yeah. Okay. Well, regardless, humongous games were a really big deal. You might have played like the putt-putt games. There was the fish, it's Pajama Sam, and they were a series of games aimed at children. There was also the Jumpstart series that were aimed at like teaching like spelling and math, et cetera. And they won a whole host of awards for, um, from, for game design aimed at children. I think what we're going to find is just how complicated it is. This was reviewed as the same idea that Charles Cornell spoke about in the Sesame Street video. It doesn't talk down to kids just because they're kids. Yeah, we're going to play it and then talk about how it connects to progressive education. Now I just have to find my lunchbox. Just a bunch of socks, nothing good. Nothing good under there. Um, like right away, it already jumps out at me. Like, it doesn't tell me where to click. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. It just went right into it. There wasn't even a menu. Oh. And here's Rachel. My Where should I click next? Where would my pajama Sam gear be? Is maybe, maybe, maybe the... This? What is this the weird star. little bucket next to his bed? Is he got a bedpan? What's happening? Hey, oh, it's trash can. Signature okay. edition all metal pajama man lunchbox. Who threw this away? I can keep What's darkness in here after I capture it. Okay. All right, darkness, here comes Pajama Sam. Hello? Is anybody in here? Darkness? Hello? <gasps> Whoa! Whoa! No! I always used to love the point-and-click adventures, even things like... I remember playing Monkey Island, um, you know, the, the old LucasArts one, the Day of the Tentacle or something like that. There used to be a whole genre of these things, and I just loved um, the level of exploration and just kind of wow. seeing what weird combinations like of things you could come up with. All right. I better go find him before Mom notices I'm gone. I just well, love the fact that it's like, now. it's a... <laughs> It sounds obvious, but it's a video game. It's like a proper video game. Like a right. lot of kids games just have you. We played those mobile games last time. You just kind of yep. click at the different things like the level of animation. Like it's all like super fun. I can explore things and there's not really any direction on what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just kind of like, no you know, clicking on random stuff and hoping it does something and have fun with it. Like, I know I need to get this board. But like, you can also I don't see, know how yeah, to get the board. How do the other get ladies interact? Anyone for tennis? Mamma mia! Oh, thanks, Maria. Maybe I have to come back. Ah. Oh. Whoa! Customs, customs, inspection. Well, well, well. It's a deranged looking tree. Did you declare these before entering the land of darkness, young man? 
This is going to be me in Germany oh, next week. No, I guess not. <laughs> I, um... I think we'd rather confiscate these items. Do you have your passport, young man? Hey, I need those. <laughs> oh, I had to get that out. Another oh, you're in a real pickle. Better pick it up like Mom said. I should match up oh, the I got... Looks like I need to find a total of 10 pairs. Look at that. Teach me to clean up. I, this is where I store my socks. Your inventory is a laundry basket. That's great. Well, I think I have to find like the socks are collectible. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm athletic. I mean, you're like seven years old, you, you, you know, flexible, as flexible as you're going to be. Well, look at what popular kids games are. And what's what's fascinating about this to me is that although there are so many kids games that are put out that I think are, again, talking down to their audience. The most yeah. popular kids games are games like Minecraft, which are incredibly complicated that a lot of adults oh. don't even understand how they work, right? Yes. Um, in the same way that like children's television, like SpongeBob still is like one of the most popular children's television shows, which is well, like it's wow. still funny even as an adult. Like it's it's pretty well written. I don't know if you call it challenging content, but it's certainly like creative. So I have to grab the rock, get into the thing and then shoot myself up. Ah, uh, okay. So. Well, all right, there's a little mail, but it's all for darkness, and it's all bills. These baskets must be the way up into darkness's house. There we go. I guess Come on. Oh, there you go. Right. Nice. I also appreciate too, just like the, what would you call them, like divergent thinking puzzles? Just to kind of say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, it's not, the world isn't going to work how you think it's going to work, but it's going to maybe play by the same physics rules. So yeah. you kind of have an idea and just kind of get to have some fun on your way to it. It's not just like point A to point B. You kind of got to zigzag your way around. Hello? Anybody home? Horrifying. What the hell is happening in this room? Oh. Whoa, nothing. What happened? It's like Beauty and the Beast or Toy Story here. According yeah. to this clock, it's 11.45. Why aren't you right. moving anymore? Okay. Two o'clock in the Hello? morning. I saw you dancing. Oh. No. Maybe I should turn on the music again. Get it, Pajama Sam. Well, I guess that's not going to work. I've got taken down to a science. I'm the biggest household of lions. My job is a daily grind. I've got mincing on my mind. I can't let you in, but you might liberate the carrots that I'm holding for the huge green salad. Hi! Hello, and welcome to The Brain Tickler! Okay. The game where you get to show how smart you really are. Actually, I just wanted to go through. I think we can arrange that, can't we, Wink? The amount of That's work right, that went into this. Right. You'll have to answer a few questions first, because as you know, no one can pass through the doors of knowledge without... I have no idea if this is what I'm supposed to be doing, but I appreciate the fact that I can do whatever I want. You're going to click on... This is definitely like a this this part right here is very McNutt coded, you know. This is definitely <laughs> something that you would do. All the way from well wherever it is he's from. Okay. Hey Chris, just real quick, how many microtransactions have we been asked to engage in? I don't um, so far in this game. You're making I don't think any. He'll be playing oh, okay, no microtransactions. Huh. The doors of knowledge. He'll be asked questions from four categories. Once he's correctly answered one question from each of the categories, he wins! And we all know what that means, right, Wink? 
Step right over here, Sam, and select your first category. Our categories today are geography, entomology, animals, and the land of darkness. I'll take geography, please. All right, here is your question. In which ocean are the islands of Hawaii located? The Pacific Ocean. That's correct. Wow! Here is your question. What is the fastest animal on land? What if I answer wrong? A horse. No, no, I'm sorry. The correct okay. answer is the cheetah. Oh, no. But don't worry. There are plenty of questions left, so you can try again. That's right. Oh, wait. So go ahead. Do they code in multiple questions? I'd like wow, animals, they have more than one. Please? All right. I know that's like, should it be surprising? But like the attention to detail to actually allow or multiple mammal. things. Yeah. Whale. That's correct. The blue whale is the world's largest mammal. Right, you learn, I can just walk into a room and I, I got to figure out like, okay, how do I get to the next part? Like, it just trains you to, to be asking those kinds of questions and think about how I can move through the space to achieve those objectives. It's kind of a cool, you know, divergent yeah. thinking puzzle machine in that way. Let's then connect this to like a classroom setting. Okay, and let's, let's connect this over to the world of education, which is the idea of like helping kids rise to the occasion and ensuring that kids actually have and face real challenges. Because one of the myths surrounding progressive education, project-based learning, interdisciplinary learning, these different terms, is that people compare it to like traditional sit and get quiz-based learning. And they say, progressive PBL stuff, that's just arts and crafts. Kids don't actually get challenged with this content. It's all just about making kids feel good. Um, and it's just not the case. It's just not true. I think certainly there are perhaps teachers who treat PBL like arts and crafts that give it a bad name. But mm. if you go through any of the theory, the research, the training on PBL, et cetera, that's not what you would walk away with. So I wanted to highlight some, some images here of a project that I did. It's one of my favorite ones I did when I was teaching. It was called Super Story RPG. And what this was, was we, I, I was working with, well, we both taught American history and government. I can't remember which one of us was teaching which at the time, uh, but we combined our classrooms together and we hooked up with this nonprofit organization called Stack Up, which is a veterans organization that uh, kind of like keeps veterans engaged through video game tournaments. And we decided like, hey, let's pair all of this together. Let's care pair together government standards, American history standards, veterans affairs, and video games and see what we come up with. And what we landed on was we designed a project that took a place over like two days a week for three or four months. It's a very long project where we taught kids how to use RPG Maker. We taught them how to write scripts. We had them interview right. various young veterans who were like in their 30s or so, like veterans of the, uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and taught them how to tell stories about what these veterans would tell them. So veterans would share really serious things about like some veterans would share about um, like PTSD. They would share about reacclimating the United States. The only creative confine we had was that the game couldn't be about war. Like we don't actually want you to be killing people. That's not the point of this activity. We're talking about the result of war or being overseas on veterans. We, we went through like allegory and theming and how games tell stories that like really are alluding to something else. We had them play um, Braid. You know what? I don't think I played Braid. I was going to get confused with Bastion. So I played yeah. Bastion. I have not played Braid. Yeah. Braid is a game that's about um, I believe it's about dropping the atom bomb. Um, it's kind of like the original it, indie game, isn't it? It's like one of like the first like really popular indie games. Yeah. Um, it has a lot of like interesting theming. So again, the goal was to challenge kids to rise to the occasion to interview veterans, learn about what's going on, face really challenging concepts and themes, write a script, learn basic programming. Um, a group of kids actually even did custom artwork. Um, this is one here in the bottom right. Like this is custom pixel art. Um, that they did, but there was a group of students who actually drew and modified all of the game assets um, for the game, um, That's awesome. which even for, I think, most adults, this is a fairly challenging task. And pretty much, I would say 90% of kids were deeply invested in this. 
Um, and we always allow kids to opt out and do something else that they wanted to. In the case of this project, I think two groups out of maybe 50 opted out of this project. Um, and you can see here on the upper left, at the end of result of this project, we did a, a fundraiser as part of our expo night. People could buy a USB with all the games on it, which was 100% oh, awesome. donated to Stack Up. I think we raised like $2,000 or $2,500 um, to the so organization awesome. through that. So the purpose of me saying that is, as you dive into like HRP's resources, and we talk about designing projects and like getting deeply involved in community work. The goal is for progressive education to be challenging. Like it's hard because hard things are engaging. People like being challenged. Do you want to pull up the diagram for what flow looks like? I don't know. It's not just like a buzzword, right? It actually explains this correlation, this connection between difficulty and competency and competency really plays into the self-determination theory of motivation as well like how does our intrinsic motivation work we want to do things that we're good at um but we get bored if the task is just repetitive or um it's it's found too easy so actually as our capacity grows and the the difficulty of the task must necessarily grow with it or we seek out more additional tasks so that way we can keep riding in that flow right Otherwise, we kind of fall into either boredom or if a task is too hard, then uh, and our capacity isn't great enough, then we kind of, oh, God, I can't do this. Oh, my anxiety. Project-based learning, the real draw of it, you know, is despite the fact that, of, yes, of course, you know, it's going to be um, a, a shift probably from what students are used to doing. Uh, there's going to be a nece necessity for a lot of front loading, but that all pays dividends and revenues um, later on for you when we actually get into it. So to have them go from being primarily extrinsically motivated by behaviorist systems we've talked about um, to being more intrinsically motivated, which really is what Pajama Sam is about, right? They're not going to handhold or tell you what you really need to do, but kind of right. open up this world and you begin to think, right? Um, what am I, what am I going to do next? That's the question you start to ask as a player and really as a project-based learning learner, um, that's how the rest of the world outside of school works. Right. It's also the reason why kids who go through a progressive style of education tend to get the same number of questions right on a test, but get the more complicated questions correct. So they may struggle more with the rote memorization component, right. which I would argue doesn't matter that much. Um, but they do well on critical reading or on using contextual clues or like learning how to learn. Those are the tools that you use in order to figure things out for your own, which is much more important than whatever typically the school curriculum is telling you that you, you have to learn. At least you can find information. Um, right. To pull up, this is just a random thing. I found this on Teacher Pay Teachers while you were talking. <laughs> um, but I think this is very indicative oh, of the type horrible. of education that a lot of folks receive. This is what my education looked like growing up and something that yeah. I know a lot of people, uh, this is, I think, an eighth grade American history assignment. So what Wait, I would this do is, is teachers pay teachers. You needed to pay to make. Uh... It was a free sample. Oh, okay. Um, I, don't so, even, I don't even want this as the free sample. This sucks. So this is a, a video that's 53 minutes long. Um, so it's all it's in black and white Great. class period. It's, it's guided notes, right? It's like, I'm sure early on in the video, it's like these workers took how long to learn their skills? Years. I just don't think that this is a good use of time because at the end of the day, what's a kid going to remember about this lesson? Maybe something really specific in that document that stood out to them, but more realistic, they're going to learn. I hate history because it's so boring. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. That's what they're going to think. We know this. From <laughs> this the is exactly rate. the path. Yeah, this is exactly yeah. the path that causes people to. You know, like when I when I was classroom teaching and I'd go get my hair cut and, you know, you're yeah. making small talk with the person cutting your hair and they would ask, like, oh, so what do you do? Oh, I'm a teacher. Oh, what do you teach? Oh, I teach history. And oh, 100 percent unanimously. Oh, I, I never liked history. Oh, I hated yeah. history. Oh, I did all this. And, and probably didn't actually learn anything on the way. Com in comparison to just yesterday, we were talking with one of the schools that we're partnered with that we help design projects with and do work with. You should check out our professional development services uh, because... When we go to schools and talk to students about like what they don't like about school, this is what they don't like about school because duh, yeah. <laughs> like it was boring. Um, so we can do something different. And one of the projects that we brainstormed with that with those individuals was their theme is how do individuals tell their stories or what can we learn from stories of the past, that, that type of deal. And what they're exploring to do is producing um, a book where each 
group of students takes on like one to three pages of that book, which is multimodal. And they're telling stories through podcasts, video, um, like creative storytelling, like poems, investigating historical elements. So like indigenous stories, family stories, whatever those might be. And they're putting that all together into something that they can actually sell and then raise money for field trips or, you know, for the school or whatever that might be. The equivalent would be like, oh, we're going to make a podcast. And instead of actually make a podcast, we'll just watch a video about how to make a podcast and then we'll do a worksheet and then we'll just move on to the next thing. Right. We'll, we'll be like, what are the parts of a podcast? Name some what which one of these is not a podcast hosting service. Um, what equipment do you need to make a podcast? It would be like it's just stuck in that space without ever actually just doing the thing. The poison to this, if you will, the reason why we don't do this is that teachers are pressured to get through this checklist of different standards. And if you slow down and focus, let's say when I did that, that veterans project, we didn't really hit a solid 25 to 33 percent of the standards, at least not in a, a meaningful way. We might have glossed oh, over a few things, but we really honed in on like three or four standards and went really slowly through them. But at the end of the day, I mean, I would rather have a group of kids who are interested and engaged in school, but also actually understand 50% of the standards as opposed to doing 100% of the standards and no one cares and everybody forgets anything everywhere. The thing that nobody ever talks about, and it, it's the inevitable um, part of like, basically not learning, the inevitable part of covering the standards is that you just forget everything because brains forget information that is not important, that doesn't have an emotional valence attached, that isn't right coded in there in multiple ways. If you only ever, you know, learn it in the same ways that everything else from school is coded in there for through lectures, tests, worksheets, videos, whatever, it's going to get lumped in with all the same things, right? Because we can only learn things so much as they have uh, uh, or retain things so much as they have a, uh, an importance, a value, a meaning, an emotional state. Right. Two giant asterisks on this, FYI. One no. asterisk is I don't think either of us are necessarily blaming teachers outright. We see this as a systemic problem. It's not that we're right. saying that like all teachers are terrible because they're not doing these things. It requires a level of training um, to do this well because it will quickly fall apart if you don't have the necessary pedagogical training. It also requires a lot of risk because there's a lot of school districts that won't allow you to do these things. And you might not have the, the context that we did to push back against that. Um, like I, I was fortunate that I taught in an environment where I had the freedom. Um, and it was still risky. I still got parent phone calls. I still had a lot of admin meetings, but I wasn't in an environment where we had like scripted curriculums or like mandated things we had to do every single day. So it's not mm -hmm. entirely the fault of, of teachers, albeit. Um, certainly in some circumstances, there's teachers that push back against these things entirely. Um, the second giant asterisk to this is that because typical PBL, PBL environments don't look like school, like if you walked into one of our classrooms while they're working on these things, uh, it's going to look like organized chaos. Like there's going to be kids in a variety of different seating environments. They're going to be seated on the floor. They're going to be up moving around. They might be in another room making a phone call. Like they're going to be doing a lot of active things. And depending on who your school administrator is, they might see that and go like, you know, what in the hell are you doing? Like, stop. Why are you not quiet and orderly like every other room? And mm -hmm. that puts a lot of pressure on you. Last thing I'll say is that even if you do PBL, there's nothing necessarily wrong with reserving days for a more traditional style of learning. Like if you do a day and it, it's a lecture day, and it's like, you know, a 35 minute lecture over something because you have to get through it. That's typically fine. Like kids know that you have to get through a certain number of standards. I used to do that. Um, there was a year where I taught where we did projects four days a week. And the fifth day I said was like, this is the uh, the air test day, which the air test is the big Ohio test. And I was like, this mm. is the day where I should just force feed you the amendments of the Constitution so you can memorize the numbers. And we're just going to do like quiz memorization. Um, yeah. And like, that's our agreement. We can do the cool stuff four days a week, but like, I got to get to the standards. I am a teacher. <laughs> um, I, I, I work yeah. in a public system. That's okay. It seems like way it's okay. Like if you know, if you're just really tired one day and you want to put a movie on. Okay. Oh my God. You can do that one day. Like who cares? Yeah. As long as it's not like <laughs> it's systemic, we're going to gamify this a little bit. We'll see how this goes. Okay. I want to make sure that people understand this versus that. 
So understand the difference between what we're talking about versus what it could be and about how roughly easy it is with proper training to take on authentic PBL, to challenge kids and do cool projects. So here's what we're going to do. If you're on our website and you go to our IDS page, the interdisciplinary school subject, it's underneath uh, the guide section of our website, you'll find a whole curriculum. Nick and I literally made a 600 plus page curriculum on lessons and project starting ideas about this type of learning. So it's, it's all free, which is nice through our partners at Holistic Think Tank. Shout out to Holistic Think Tank. What we're going to do is we're going to use our project generator, Nick, and you'll go first is I'm going to hit the button that generates a new project idea. I want you to describe starting what would the traditional way of learning this thing be? So like what would the actual 45 minute class period look like if you were learning about this content? Then okay. I want you to take like 30 seconds and brainstorm just a general overview of what the more challenging, interesting PBL version of that thing would be. Keep in mind, right. you already have the starter. Like that's what this is, is the starter for that project. Okay. So you could use that. All right, so here we go. Highlighting the errors of the past. Positive intentions often have unforeseen consequences. Have students research various attempts at solving the world problems, such as global poverty, women's rights, climate change, or militarization. Highlighting how a positive action without proper research could lead to disastrous outcomes. And then compose an art piece that exemplifies this danger. Yeah, I don't think I could teach this lesson in Iowa, Chris. Uh, I don't. I, it's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could get away with it. I'd have to move. Um, well, it's interesting. I think this this is the good way to do it, isn't it? Is that what well, you're getting at? Like, yeah. Well, what oh, is okay. the, what would this typically be if it was traditional? And then, like, imagine what this looks like with the with oh, this. Oh, what it would what it would typically be? Okay, so I think typically what this would be this would be embedded into like. Con a content coverage style like history survey course so you'd right. be like i don't know you'd be talking you'd be have gone through 1300s 1400s 1500s etc and maybe like you get to napoleon right and you like use this as the framing for learning about napoleon's invasion of russia or something and so you're like okay did napoleon you know what were his failures what were his successes was he a good guy? Was he a bad guy? Kind of thing, like looking at his yeah. reign. You know, that'd be just like a very standard thing where kids, it's kind of like analysis. So it's a little bit higher level in terms of thinking of blooms, right? Um, but you're not really doing anything with it. Maybe, ooh, maybe you'd like stage a debate or have him write an essay um, right. about like, okay, was Napoleon a hero or a tyrant? Like, you know, it, did the French Revolution. The, the, the French Revolution. There might be like this like random question at the end that's like, yeah. and like, does this sound like something that could occur today? And it's like one sentence and you turn it in on Google Classroom and then you get a 10. And then that's the last we ever spoke about um, that yeah. as a, a concept. So then taking this as a prompt, what would you see this looking like? So imagine that you had this prompt as a teacher and now you're doing this in a PBL sense. This is your, your, your idea. Yeah, I think in practice, I would probably provide maybe like a, a smaller menu of maybe five options to be like, hey, here are some things that you could choose from as it relates to uh, kind of like current day issues, right? Um, or pitch to me your idea for what you wanted to tackle based on another thing. And, you know, that that helps kids kind of get over their choice fatigue or, you know, decision anxiety and that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, maybe provide some starters and models uh, around what either mixed media or other things that kids could use to be able to portray their, their idea. And, uh, and yeah, I don't know, kind of go from there. Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the end product would look something like, like sadly, a lot of times in art and I, I felt victim to this too. Um, it's, it's, I think it's sometimes okay in art classes just to do fun stuff, but I think we often leave out the examples of artists making statements like towards like social justice or changing the world, mm. which is a huge component of the art world. Like one way you potentially could do this, a teacher at the school I used to work at uh, did this, where maybe you research um, how clothing in dyes like impact the world. And then you, in a science class as well, um, partner and learn like how do you make alternative forms of dye that like don't impact the environment. And then you do art pieces using that dye. You could also mm. do maybe recycled art, like reclaimed art to talk about climate change. So you could make an art piece that thematically represents climate change but you mm. create the piece entirely using recycled goods, which you'll find a lot of like science museums and art museums and stuff. But that requires like, 
a lot of critical thought. Like that's going to take you weeks to think about and even come up with a general idea. Like I can't just like make that in my head. Like if you told me, Hey, the assignment is to write a five paragraph essay about why climate change is bad or good or whatever, yeah. whatever your opinion might be, I guess, or not real. Um, is a chat GPT task. And I, and once a kid gets good at school, that's not hard. Um, obviously reading and writing are important, but that, that from a, from a standpoint of like actual challenge can be gamed. We can game around that system. You can't right. really game around the idea of making recycled art with an artist statement about what you're, it's a, it's an interpretive complex thing. Um, right. it's just way cooler. Like so much, well, so and, much more. And it has, yeah. it has the provision in there too, to be able to showcase it publicly in some way. Right. So either in a school building, right. In the, in the, uh, in an auditorium, not an auditorium, like in an entryway, like a, a four, foyer, a foyer. How do you pronounce that word? I don't, I don't know. know. I think it's but foyer in the, in the uh, United States. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so like in some place where, you know, you normally would, would display what, like athletic trophies or something like yeah. put the stuff that the kids make for school yeah. or, you know, partner with other local institutions, you know, to, to publicly display the kids art with like a little artist statement, maybe like a local bank or, um, you know, other kinds of place that that uh, the community is involved in or or have like an expo night, you know, around this project and actually have kids showcase or do like a, you know, an art gallery kind of style thing where you can come sure. in, have or some put it out in the community, the like have people actually yes. see this thing, like partner with a museum and put it there. It, yes. Museum always um, or like really randomly airports. I don't know if you ever like right. randomly go to the airport and you see like the art installation. There's always these little and, displays. Yeah. yeah. And you might say like, well, does it really matter? I think, yeah. I mean, to an extent, there's there's a certain point of pride of being able to display your work for a more public audience. It, it adds to the actual reasoning to why we do things. You're bringing awareness to something. You're celebrating something. I think ultimately what we're saying is this is the this is the pajama samification of education, right? You're making a <laughs> a more complex, interesting, nuanced thing to sink your teeth into instead of just clicking through uh, the worksheet and then calling it a wrap. And that's the end of the right. Day. Yeah. Um, the, my uh, my the master, or my uh, doctor's thesis will be called pajama gamification or whatever. <laughs> pajama samification. You have to say it 10 times fast. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the, the industrial revolution worksheet is the mobile game of, uh, of education yeah. you know it's all on rails it's pretty mindless you're gonna forget about it it's not particularly emotionally engaging or challenging or anything else um yeah so we gotta pajama samify it a little bit